space. So this is a space of mode two hyper cycles. Okay, and uh, it was proved following the results of uh, uh, Amgren that uh, the cohomological ring for this space, this is back to the Z two coefficients. This is the uh, polynomial ring over Z two of a single generator, lambda bar. OK, so uh, with this structure, um, we can define the k sweep out. So where k is an arbitrary integer. So a continuous map from a finite dimensional parameter space into the space of a multiple hyper cycles so so this is uh, a key sweep part so if we have the following condition for cohomo uh, cohomology that is the pullback of uh, lambda bar to the case car product is not zero in the uh, case cohomological group on x uh, using the z2 coefficients OK, so let's do uh, a simple exercise. So this is the following lemma. So, so if phi is uh, a k sweep out, that implies the uh, push forward map of the fundamental group. So this is surjective. OK, uh, let's try to uh, do this baby exercise. So, um, so by this cohomological condition, so we can denote uh, lambda to be the pullback of uh, lambda bar. Then this is not 0 in the first, uh, in the first cohomology of x. OK, so uh, element is not 0 in this cohomological group implies that uh, there must exist some cycle. So the, uh, uh, the product between them is not 0. So this implies the existence of, uh, of a cycle. So this is the unit circle into a space of x such that uh, so, so th this is not 0, lambda act on, uh, on gamma. I mean, this is not zero by the pairing between uh, homology and cohomology. So by definition, so lambda is the pullback of lambda bar. So if you plug in, in so this is the, uh, the lambda bar act on phi of, uh, phi of gamma. Okay. So we know that uh, so this is a cycle in this large space. And that implies this is not 0. So this, this implies phi of gamma. So it's not 0 in pi 1 of this large uh, space of hypercycles. Okay. So this gives the uh, surjectivity for this map. So it almost uh, follows from definition. So this fact will be used uh, very soon. OK, so uh, with the definition of case report, so we can recall the definition of case volume spectrum. So it's, uh, it's a real number. Depends only on the manifold and the metric. So that's defined by the mean max. So you take infimum over all k sweep out, and then take uh, maximum or supremum over uh, these families. You take the area of uh, phi of x. Kay. And uh, we know that this is strictly positive. So by the work of uh, Amgren in 60, 
1 is less equal than omega 2, omega 3, which converges to plus infinity. And this is follows from the Grom of Goose, Marcus, and Evist estimates, shows it goes to infinity. OK, so the idea is try to realize this sequence of numbers by minimal surfaces, which is the min max theorem. So it's uh, due to Armgren for the weak solution, 65, um, piece for dimension between 3 and 6 in 81. And uh, Shin Simon, 81 for hair dimensions. and. Uh, uh, Fernando and Andre uh, for D2 coefficients and for the uh, uh, Morse index estimates. So uh, let's just state the results for the regular dimensions. So uh, the theorem says that the sequence of numbers for each of them can be realized as the sum of the areas. So um, I just uh, uh, ignore the uh, index k here from 1 to some l with uh, integer coefficients. So here the sigma i is a smooth, uh, closed, uh, connected, embedded, so minimal hypersurfaces. And uh, these m i are integers, and these, uh, this set of numbers are called uh, the multiplicity. So Fernando and Andre also proved the following Morse index estimates. So this is a Morse index of the support is less equal than uh, k, so where k is the uh, number of parameters. Uh, let me give a quick remark. So uh, before they were able to prove those Morse index upper bound, people didn't know whether this number can be realized as a sum of areas. You can write that as a limit of the infimum over such sums. But under this Morse index upper bound together with the Ben Sharp's compacting theorem, you can realize in this way. OK, okay so uh, that was a quick uh, review. And uh, today I'll, I'll go to sketch the ideas of uh, um, the following conjecture. made by Fernando and Andre, so it's uh, still for these regular dimensions. So if, if G is a bumpy metric, so they conjecture that the set of uh, uh, connect components in the min max minimal hypersurfaces are, are all two-sided. And uh, so this multiplicity are identical to B1. So that's a conjecture. Uh, so let's go to see the strategy of proof. So uh, in short, that is to approx approximate the area functional by uh, some other functional. So the uh, functional I took is the lat lang multiplier I used with Jonathan in the study of CMC and PMC problems. So in particular, if the hypersurface is written at the, the boundary of some set, and if H is a smooth function, so the uh, uh, functional we use is uh, we use Mexico AH. So that applies to the domain. So that's area of the boundary minus the integral of uh, h. So we know that uh, so if sigma is a, is a critical point, I mean by a smooth critical point of this functional, so the mean curvature for this hypersurface with respect to the outer normal for those, this domain is prescribed by the restriction of sigma into h. So this is a prescribing mean curvature. A problem. 
equals the PMC problem. So the uh, my idea consists of two parts. So the first part is try to uh, translate the problem defined over the mod two hyper cycles to the space of domains for which you can define this functional. So the first part is to study the min max so in the space of mod two cycles. So versus so the min max so in the space of uh, Cartier polysites. So this is the space of subset such that the boundary has finite finite Hausdorff measure. So we also call it the space of Cartier polysites. So the second part is to study what happens if we approximate what happens if we approximate by the PMC Mimax theory. So uh, in the following, I'm going to elaborate uh, the, the two parts of the ideas. OK, so uh, now let's uh, start with the first part. So I start with uh, Lama. So that was observation by uh, Fernando and Andre. So the Lama says that if you look at the boundary map from the space of Cartier polis to the uh, mod two circles, so this is uh, a 2 to 1 cover. The covering map is measured with respect to the weak topology or the flat topology. OK. So uh, it's easy to see that this is continuous because uh, uh, if you give a domain a map to the boundary, and so take, take the, uh, the, the corresponding mod 2 cycles, so I claim this is uh, it's a continuous map. So particularly, um, say, if you have two of them, if you minus, take, uh, take the difference. So that's a difference of omega 1 minus omega 2. So here, you, you take the difference as uh, uh, mod 2 cycles, n plus 1 dimensional mod 2 cycles. And from this equation, you know that uh, the flat norm di distance between these two guys are controlled by the, the, the mass norm difference of omega 1, omega 2. So that gives you a continuous map. So that part is uh, relatively easy. So the second part is to show that uh, each element here corresponds to two different pre-images. And that is uh, a little bit uh, uh, involved, but it's also easy. OK, so let's recall the definition of this part. So I said it's the space of mod 2 hypercycles. But last time I mentioned it is a connect component of that large space containing 0, which means that for every element here, you can connect to the 0 cycles. So that means that for any given hyper, uh, mod 2 hypersurface, so then so there exists a continuous uh, one parameter family so inside this space, such that, uh, such that you started with an uh, empty site or 0, or you ended with, uh, with sigma. So what we are going to do is you take a fine enough subdivision of this interval, so I applied isoparametric inequality. So if you take a, take a subdivision, uh, this is a union of uh, ti, ti plus 1. So you take the subdivision such that uh, the flat norm between any two nearby guys is uh, small enough. Uh, OK, L let me move to the other side. OK, so for each 2 pi r ti to ti plus 1, so we can apply the isoparametric inequality by
So the isoparametric inequality in geometric measure theory mainly tells you that you can pick up the optimal um, domain between these two guys. So this is that uh, there exists a uh, uh, guy in the uh, top dimensional. So this is a top dimensional cycle. This d2 coefficient means that it has multiplicity 1, such that uh, so uh, the boundary is sigma ti plus 1 minus ti. Okay. And then you sum all of them together, so that uh, that's u to be the sum of ui. Everything are done in this space. This is a top dimensional mode 2 cycles from 1 to k. So then this is a top dimensional. OK, so uh, there's identification between the top dimensional mode 2 cycle with the space of Cartier-Polis. So this is the space of Cartier-Polis that such that uh, we easily see that uh, uh, sigma equals the boundary of u and also equals the boundary of uh, m minus u. Okay. So that gives you the 2 to 1, 2 to 1 covering result. So every element downstairs corresponding to two elements above, this is given just simply applied as a parametric uh, idea. OK? <coughs> OK, so this is 2 to 1 cover. So we would imagine how can, can we lift the mapping downstairs to something upstairs. And then use the lemma I just proved. We can, we can do that. So, so we take a, so we take a case vapor. So um, let me just write it over, over here. Uh, so, so the idea is that uh, now we have, a, we have a 2 to 1 cover over here. So can we do something so as to lift the whole map up, uh, upstairs? OK. so. Uh, Let's do the following simple algebraic topology argument. So we know that the push forward, I said the push forward from the fundamental group of the parameter space to the fundamental group of the mod 2 cycles. So this is z2 but, uh, by, by theorem of Amgren. So we know that this is directive. So if we pull back the zero element, or the zero uh, subgroup over here. So this is uh, a subgroup of a uh, fundamental group of x with, uh, with index 2. Okay. So once you have such a structure, if you have subgroup of index 2, so you can take a, you can take a, a, a double cover of x and a lifting. So actually, in definition, we always assume x is connected. That doesn't, uh, uh, that, that's uh, still OK. So this implies that uh, so there exists a uh, connected double cover. Of x, so and, uh, and the lifting map. So in this picture, it means that uh, from uh, the basic uh, algebraic topology, if this is connected, you construct a connected double cover. So and you have a lifting map such that you have this uh, this this diagram commutes. Or in other words, so uh, if you take a v tilde and then take a partial, that's the same as you take a, a pi and then compose with phi. So using this basic observation, you, uh, you lift everything upstairs. However, this space, the topological type is just like R infinity, it's this contractible space. So there's no way to talk about any uh, homotopy theory, f free homotopy theory, or min max theory 
be applied to free homotopy uh, classes. So a uh, natural ways to think about whether we can do relative uh, homotopy theory and associate a mimic theory over there. That's exactly what Fernando and Andre did in their proof of the Wilmot conjecture, because the space of uh, integer cycles in F3 is also contractible. So they were able to find a uh, uh, highly non-trivial, a deep relative homotopy class for which they can detect the uh, Clifford torus. So that's, that's one of the motivating ideas to deal with this problem. So before we set down to details, let's just try to plot a, a, a graph. So first, without a loss of generality, so we can, we can assume that uh, the maximum area for this chosen case v plot it's very close to the case volume spectrum. You can, al you can always pick up an uh, optimal approximate sequence. So if we plot a graph, so this is area, so this is the parameter space. As I said, we have a lifting, so this is a larger parameter space, x tilde. So if we first focus on the x, look at the graph of phi, so what we would uh, C R uh, something like uh, like that. Okay, so um, so I say that is almost optimal. So so this is omega k. So so it's nearly optimal. So that's a graph of phi. So to do an interesting or to do a meaningful relative homotopy, so what I was trying to think about is try to just look at these small pieces which, which are above omega k. So if you look at the pre-image, you just look at a few, uh, few sets. Okay. Um, you would imagine that uh, so these parts which detect the minimal hypersurfaces are the significant part. So that's the that's idea I would like to continue. So let me try to formulate the idea uh, before we uh, continue on this graph. OK, so the idea now is to try to identify so where we can detect uh, smooth minimal hypersurfaces. So let me first denote that uh, that S to be the space of uh, closed hypersurfaces, so which are smooth, uh, closed, so embedded, so minimal hypersurfaces, such that the area are bounded. So there's no way, uh, no. That's fine if you just uh, allow it to be below omega k plus a small number, whatever, 1 or any epsilon. So, and also the Morse index of sigma is bounded by k. So you know that I allow them to have multiplicities in this setup. It can be a multiple cover of certain um, combinations of connect components. So, and the, the index are measured for the support, which are the same as uh, what Fernando and Andre proved. So you would imagine that these uh, red parts are, are these hypersurfaces along this k-parameter family that's close to the smooth minimal hypersurfaces. And you want, to, you want to look at what happens under this situation. So, uh, so there are a few remarks for this space. So by, by Ben Sharp's compactness results, so in a bumpy metric, this is a discrete site. So I think you're all experts, so I don't need to really write down the argument. Uh, the, the argument would be that if you have a sequence of, if you have infinitely many of them satisfying the area upper bound and Morse index upper bound, the subsequence will convert to a smooth limit, and the smooth limit would carry a non-trivial Jacobi field, which violates the uh, bumpiness assumption. So on the bumpy metric, this is a finite site. So uh, uh, in other words, if you imagine each of the maximum over there, each of the peak, detect only one minimal surface, then there are only a finite many of the peaks. OK, so uh, uh, actually, uh, it was uh, proved by uh, Fernando Andre that uh, so this set of uh, more two cycles, 
the set of mode two cycles. So such that they are closed. So this is a verb for distance, but you can imagine just a certain sort of distance over a space of uh, uh, cycles, so which are close to minimal surfaces. So for some very small epsilon, so this this is uh, uh, contractible. in the space of uh, more two hypercycles. So the idea is that this is a discrete site. So a neighborhood of discrete sites should be contractible. Actually, that's not trivial. That was proved by Amgren. But uh, you can imagine that's something uh, plausible. Uh, I use a verbal distance because when epsilon is small enough, you can prove that they all are in a flat norm a neighborhood of this discrete site, which are contractible by uh, Amgren theorem. So that was the idea behind uh, Fernando and Andre's proof. OK, so I pick up a discrete site which would detect these peaks. And also, we know that a neighborhood of them is contractible. So, um, so now it's the time to uh, define uh, rigorously where we mean by these right circles. So I define this to be uh, a subset of x I denote by y. So this is. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the hypersurfaces such that uh, they are close to uh, they are close to smooth hypersurfaces for this epsilon. So if you look at the picture, so these are y's. So this is my y. This is my y. Okay, I claim that not all of these red circles are y. Some of them may be fake. I'm going to deal with fake very soon, but there are at least some of them that should be should be my y. So so these are uh, hypersurfaces that are close to the min max minimal hypersurfaces. Uh, uh, th th so these are um, these surfaces that's close to the smooth guys. All you detect the peaks. Okay, so I define y. I claim that some of them may be fake. I'm going to deal with that soon, but let's see what we have until here. So by this result, we know that uh, by this result we know that so y is a uh, y less in contractible space. So the fundamental group of phi of y should be zero in pi one of. Uh, okay. So because it, it lies in a contractible site, so it has a trivial fundamental group. So this is a very important observation in the proof. Because uh, it actually tells us that uh, if, I, if I look at the pre-image under, under pi, so for each y, I should get two a uh, strong copy. So y plus y minus, y plus y minus. That means that uh, so this pi is a production map. So it's the inverse of y should be written as disjoint copy. So uh, where y plus and y minus are homeomorphic copies of y, so it should be disjoint copies by this uh, result. Is that OK? That's a basic, uh, all of them are fundamental topology. So the reason I want a pre-image of y to be disjoint copies is something you will see very soon. Uh, so, so say that uh, if I if I look at uh, this is my phi. If I look at my phi tilde, so th this part would be my phi tilde. I would see. So here you see a peak. Here you see another peak. You see a peak. You see another peak. So this is uh, my phi phi tilde. Suppose I forgot this part. So that means that uh, uh, each of the peak is homeomorphic to the peak over here. So. Uh, I, I'm going to do it soon. So this is a fake part. It's a, it's a fake part. That's, that's something I'm going to do immediately. So I just tell you that the, the idea is just you want to, you want to so this is, this is something happens in Zn. This is something happens in Cm. You want to localize so that in Cm, you, look at, you, you, you find the similar local peaks. So now let, let me first explain what happens here, and then we can continue to really change gears to this part. Uh, so if you follow my uh, argument over here, so uh, 
not all of the peaks would detect minimal hypersurfaces, but there's a way by peaks combinatorial argument you can pull down this uh, fake part. So that is uh, so. This is uh, on one hand. On the other hand, let's look at Z, which is the complement of Y. So that may contain this fake maximum, and we can consider we consider the maps of phi restricted to Z. Okay, so if you have a peak, if the peak does not detect any smooth minimal hypersurfaces, then, then, then John Pace has this uh, combinatorial tightening argument that tells us you can pull down that part. Uh, let's stay. So, it has this uh, combinatorial tightening argument. So, so the main idea is that uh, if you focus on this side, of uh, phi x, where x belongs to z. So this is a set of hypersurfaces. So say if if no element is uh, close to smooth, uh, smooth close invited minimal hypersurfaces, then then John Pitt said that uh, one can we can homotopically so deform so phi to phi phi prime such that uh, you really decreases the maximum uh, area such that the maximum of the area of phi prime of x. So now x is in z, is strictly less than that of uh, of v. Uh, so um, as I said, that this is uh, more or less or less equal than omega k. So if you go back to my picture, so John P's uh, combinatory argument says that. Uh, so if you see a thick, uh, thick peak where the area is large, but it does not close to any smooth closed minimal surfaces, so then there's, there's a deformation. Okay? So you cut, it, you cut it off the peak, and you lower down the maximum area. So then you go from phi to phi prime. So after John Pitt's combinatorial argument, what you really see is that uh, so all these uh, Hypersurfaces which are close to smooth close embedded minimal hypersurfaces give you a, a peak like that. And the corresponding domain has simple fundamental group. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, this is the this is idea, and, and, the, and the formulation is really complicated. And if you really want to go through this uh, tightening argument, there are several uh, very heavy uh, arguments, for instance. So this is a continuous family. You first go through a discretization process by uh, Marcus and Nevis. And then you, you apply this combinatorial argument, which is really applied to the discrete set. And then you need to go to do an interpolation process to make them continuous um, in that way. So this is a huge, huge argument. But after this huge argument, what you would see, if you check the graph of phi, you will see over there. So you see a few peaks, and the, and, and the peak of the maximum um, are small, so corresponding to some y's, which can be lifted into disjointed homeomorphic copies. OK, so combining this part and that part, let's see what we get. We get what we get is on the right. So um, I'll assume my phi is my phi prime. and. Uh, Okay, so that is omega k. So you detect a few uh, local maximums.
OK, so if we focus on what they happened over here, so if we, if we fix the values of phi tilde restricted to z tilde, well, z tilde has everything outside these uh, uh, four circles. So then I claim that uh, no homotopic deformation of uh, of phi tilde restricted on y tilde can can decrease. So the maximum of the area. So this time you always need to take boundary because the value are assumed on open sites, uh, Cartier poly sites. Can can decrease the values below omega k. So the idea is that uh, so um, each of the local peaks here is homeomorphic to what you see over there. If you're able to decrease this down on the right hand side, I mean you separate them into two strong copies, so you see a deformation over here. So you can deform all the peaks below omega k. That's a contradiction to the definition of omega k. Okay. So that's along the key idea. If you lift it up, if you identify the y, so if you only allow deformations over y, you should detect non-trivial minimal surfaces, even working in the space of uh, Cartier poly sites. So with this observation, we know that we should uh, fix the values assumed over z tilde and do the relative min max. So that is, uh, we consider the relative, uh, relative homotopic class. Let me go here. So um, uh, uh, before I, I continue, let me give another remark. So um, from my understanding, if we follow the very recent work by Marcus Nevis on the um, um, Morse index for multi-priest minimal surfaces, they, de they designed a second tightening, I guess motivated by Pace commentary arguments. For there, I think they proved that uh, after their second tightening, you'll never see this fake peak, if that my understanding was right. So if, if, if one goes from there, you don't need to do this uh, z part. You can directly identify y and continue, because uh, you already know that the maximum area over z is strictly less than omega k. But that was after the second tightening process. Am I right? Uh, is my understanding right? <laughs> OK, so when I designed this argument, I didn't notice that part. So I, I just uh, do, do the tightening over z by hand. OK, so now let's go back and continue. So we change gear from, uh, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, or from below to, uh, to up, uh, from downstairs to upstairs. So we can, we can consider a relative homotopy class. So that is the homotopy class of phi tilde. Well, we fix the uh, values assumed over z tilde. So this is a relative, uh, this is a relative homotopy class. in the space of a Cartier poly size, or the space of top, top dimensional multiple cycles. And then uh, the min max value is something we want. So if you formulate the min max over here, so that's the uh, infimum over any relative, uh, relative map, so the maximum of the area. So x is in x tilde. So actually, even x works in x tilde, but it's only allowed to change over y tilde. So this is a boundary of uh, psi tilde of x. So we know that this should be strictly uh, greater or equal than omega k. Okay. Now actually, you can prove that it's identical to omega k. So if you, if you choose a right uh, approximation, and this is strictly larger than the maximum assumed over z tilde. So this is area. So, so if you if you fix uh, a large amount of values, uh, this min max is non-trivial because of this uh, strict inequality over here. Okay. okay so that's the first part: the min max in uh, space of multiple cycles with versus the min max over relative cycles in space of Cartier polys. 
So the, the, the reason, so there are two folds of the outcome. One fold is that we successfully change this to this space, so we can approximate by the uh, like launch multiplayer functional. So the second outcome is that you get strict inequality. You have some margin or some gap to play the game. So uh, let me uh, go to the second part. Okay, so we uh, we take uh, so we take uh, we start with the arbitrary function. So we'll uh, prescribe the function later. So we take uh, a smooth function and uh, a small epsilon. So what I'm going to change is I change the area functional to this uh, a epsilon h functional. So um, so. Let's write it down. All right, uh, we copy the formula. I call this L tilde epsilon to to be something. I change the area to that. So that's still an uh, infimum. So psi tilde is in this relative homotopic class, and now the maximum is still in x tilde. But this time I use this uh, epsilon h. So uh, so this is uh, defined over over the site. So by definition, this is the area of the boundary. So minus epsilon, the integral over the site of h, the volume. So because there is a, a small room, so once you take epsilon small enough, you still get a non-trivial inequality over here. So this is maximum x is in z tilde, so a epsilon h of phi tilde of x. So uh, that's how we change gear to, to that problem. Uh, from here, we can apply the uh, PMC theory I developed with Jonathan. Let me just formulate the, uh, the uh, precise statement. So, uh, so Jonathan and I developed the regularity theory corresponding to a min max. Uh, uh, min max variable associated with this functional. So uh, that's here. And I try to just adapt a little bit, uh, push a little bit more to, uh, uh, to adapt to this theory. Um, so in particular, for these regular dimensions, so, uh, so there exists an, an open and uh, dense set of uh, smooth functions depending on g, such that uh, for any prescribing function. So actually, if you check the definition, you know that if h is there, so epsilon h is also there. So epsilon is not 0. So for any h, so we, there exists a smooth, closed, so almost embedded. Uh, sigma n inside m, satisfying the following uh, uh, conditions. So being almost invited, we mean that uh, it can be uh, some local touching picture, but the touching side has higher co-dimensions, uh, has co-dimension at least one. So uh, these solutions satisfy the following four uh, conditions. So the first condition is that it is uh, it's the boundary of some some subset, uh, open subset of the ambient space. So that's one of the advantage. So you, you do variational theory over boundaries because the area those AH functional satisfy the one-sided maximum principle I explained last time. So you don't see a collapsing. So eventually you see a boundary structure uh, as worse as this picture. This is still a boundary. So that's the first very important. So that actually tells you that for this perturbed functional, so the solution has multiplicity one. So second, so it's a, it's a critical point. So the mean curvature is given by epsilon times h on sigma. And the third, so you know that the epsilon h functional applied to this omega, which is the area of sigma minus epsilon 
integral h dh. So this is uh, L tilde epsilon, so that, that's that number. And finally, so uh, by following the same argument as Marcus Navis proof, you can prove that the Morse index of the sigma is bounded by k. So here, this is this is the Morse index. For, for this uh, y epsilon h functional. So you can calculate the second variation for that functional and define the uh, Morse index as a number of negative eigenfunctions. So that's, uh, that's the uh, regularity theory for, for this uh, problem. OK, so uh, then naturally, you let epsilon go to 0 and check what happens. So letting. Epsilon go to zero. So this is a place to apply a variant of Bain-Sharpe's compactness theorem. So you can adapt that to the uh, uh, PMC problems. So uh, we have a few uh, things. So first, you want to look at the numbers l tilde epsilon. So because the arrow term is uniformly bounded, it's the uniform. Sorry, is epsilon multiply something which is uniformly bounded? So first, you know that uh, l tilde epsilon converges to l tilde which is my case volume spectrum. So you go back to the original problem. And then, so you look at the convergence of uh, sigma epsilon. So I should say that for each epsilon, so you have a sigma epsilon over here. So this is a sequence. So a subsequence will subconverge. To, uh, to some smooth limit. So the convergence is uh, smoothly, so away from from at most at most k points. So because the Morse index is k, and also the convergence may have multiplicity with uh, integer multiplicity. So uh, for, for simplicity of uh, uh, arguments, so we can assume like without a loss of generality that this is connected. Otherwise, you just work with each connect component. So then I can assume the multiplicity is a single number m. So in summary, it says that uh, so the sequence converges uh, in this sense, I mean smoothly, graphically, away from at most key points to a limit with the integer multiplicity. Okay. Let's check what happens or what we know for sigma infinity from these uh, four properties. So the first property, so if I do it for epsilon, I know it has multiplicity 1, it's a boundary. But once I take a limit, I say there may be an integer multiplicity. So that's, a, that's what, what we don't know. That's something we need to check. But the other three properties are preserved pretty well. So, so if you let epsilon go to 0, that tells you that the mean curvature of the limit should be 0. So, so, so you know that the limit is a minimal surface. And uh, third, so this is like multiplier term will vanish So when epsilon go to 0. So the area of the total measure are preserved. So together with these things, it tells you that uh, so m times this area of sigma infinity equals omega k. That's to say that my uh, m copies of sigma infinity is the um, min max minimal surface. Okay. So if you're able to prove m equal to b1, you, you get a multiplicity one min max minimal hypersurface. So lastly, that's also useful. So that Morse index are preserved, if you check. So index of the support is bounded by k. Okay. So the question reduces to say whether we can show that the integer has to be 1. So, so the idea is that uh, so we can we can find uh, a nice first constraint uh, h, which lies in the open dense subset I found with uh, Jonathan, such that uh, so m has to be one. So that that's what we want to do. Okay, so we assume that the limit is uh, uh, connected. So so. 
let's try to analyze the, the converging behavior. So uh, I try to motivate by uh, another proof of this weighted Morse index, uh, Morse index upper bound conjecture so as to give you some feeling about this uh, type of convergence. That's a very standard for Ben Sharp theorem. Um, so let me state it's a type of convergence. So, uh, so by this uh, smooth convergence of it from finite many points, we know that for epsilon small enough, so for so epsilon very small, so you can find sigma epsilon that uh, has a decomposition. So as uh, as M sheeted uh, graph. Over over the limit, but away from away from uh, some bad points. Okay, and also because that's where this condition ca come up. Uh, so this important condi condition come up from here. So because sigma epsilon is written as a boundary. So you know that the uh, normals must alternate sign. And, uh, and the outer normals of omega epsilon should uh, alternate, alternate orientations. So that's the outcome of this convergence. Uh, let me draw a, a picture to uh, reveal what does this mean. So let's assume this is my limit sigma infinity. And these are, uh, say, two bad points. Okay, so I mean, away from the two bad points, so we see a nice graphical decomposition. So the graphical decomposition is something like uh, you have a. So this is uh, this is sigma omega. And the normals. I say this. This means that the normals alternate sign. OK? I mean, that's one of the key observations Jonathan I found in our uh, PMC and CM CMC series. So because if you have two sheets that are very close and point to the same side, they cannot bond the region. So that's where uh, one is very essential for, for these uh, things. OK? So if with, this, uh, with this picture, so you can always pick up the so-called uh, bottom sheet and the top sheet. So say that uh, sigma epsilon 1 is the graph over sigma infinity of a graphi graphical function epsilon 1. Uh, so this is uh, epsilon, sorry, this is epsilon 2. This is u epsilon 1. And this is the uh, bottom, bottom sheet. And uh, epsilon 2 is the graph of u epsilon 2, which is, uh, which is the top sheet. And we also let the difference between u epsilon 2 and u epsilon 1 to be the height. So this is the height functions. So up to here, so um, I think most of the audience are expert over minimal surfaces theory knows that we can look at the convergence of the normalized uh, function for h epsilon. So then you should deduce some inter information. So let me, let me go through the, uh, uh, the arguments to check what is the limit of the renormalized function for, for, the, a, for the height. Uh, so there are mainly like uh, two important uh, two important uh, cases. So one is easy, and the other is, uh, is a bit harder. So case one. OK, 
phase one is when the multiplicity is uh, odd number. Because, uh, uh, I mean, we try to prove by contradiction. By odd number, I mean that is greater than one. And we want to deduce a contradiction for this case. So if you go back to the picture, so if there are only three sheets, one, two, three, so the nice, nice thing is that the normal, uh, sorry, the mean curvature always points upward. So for that case, so if you write down the mean curvature um, for the graphical problem, so you get that the mean curvature for sigma epsilon, uh, sigma epsilon one equals h restricted to sigma, sorry, epsilon h, um, epsilon one, and so. Well, you can always pick your orientation so that you have uh, plus sign or you you have both minus sign, but that's the same because the, the, the normals of the two graphs all point the same way. Okay, so then you subtract the difference. So if you subtract the difference. So by results of uh, Leon, Leon Simon, you know that uh, so the first order term, so the leading ter leading term is the Jacobi operator of the uh, limit minimal hypersurface applies to the difference plus a, a small o term of the height difference. So, so this is a Leon's result, and by this equation, the other the other part tells you that that's the difference between h restricted to the upper graph minus h restricted to the bottom graph. Kay. And by the fundamental theorem of calculus, so you see that this the right hand side is also a small o term because of the epsilon. That's by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's easy. So, so the standard way to do that is to, to pick up a point P, which is away from the bad point, and then you take the normalized, normalized function. So P is a point in sigma infinity. Minus the bad points. Okay, so uh, by elliptic regularity, the Harnack estimates you will convert this locally smoothly to some limit. So, uh, so from here you know that h is always positive. Uh, so we know that uh, uh, for for this case, for this case, um, this uh, so this is uh, this is h h epsilon. It's always positive because of some strong maximum principle I proved with Jonathan. So that means that if, if some point is zero, the height is zero, then this sheet and that sheet has to coincide with each other. That's not allowed. So if you have something with opposite sign, you can play the game and always prove that's strictly positive. So then you get something strictly positive, and this is a smooth function over sigma minus uh, some bad point. And also, uh, we know that. Uh, it satisfy, satisfy this equation. So then you apply the standard removal singularity results by Brown White. So then you can you can do one more step. Say that uh, extends smoothly to a, a function on sigma infinity. So now you produce a non-trivial Jacobi field. So you deduce a contradiction. OK, so I also assume that this limit is two-sided. If this is one-sided, you, you take a look at the double cover. So you, you, can, you can play the same game. So that's case one. You deduce a contradiction. So when you have all number of sheets. So uh, the harder ca case is when you have, uh, uh, say, um, even number of sheets, particularly when you have two, two, uh, two sheets. So how you handle the limit. So case two. So um, is a even number. So the main difference is that the top sheet and the bottom sheet has a mean curvature points into two different directions. So if you listed that equation, so you would see some something different. So let me say this is minus, and then 
I, I, I make the orientation um, so that the, the top sheet has positive direction. Okay. So you have 1 plus 1 minus. If you play the same game, so if you subtract the two equations, apply Leon's trick, what you get is that uh, the Jacobi operator applies to the, uh, the height function. So plus a small o term, so equals, so you sum them, right? So this time, this is the sum. So u epsilon 2 plus u epsilon 1. The sum of two functions. So again, you play the trick, you take a renormalization, you take the limit. So there's some, some tricky things is like, how do you take the renormalization? So then you need to compare uh, two cases. You need to compare epsilon and uh, h epsilon p. So this is a uh, value over a point. But Hanak estimates this more or less measures the separation between the two sheets, the top and bottom sheets, because you have uniform estimates. So the first case is that uh, when epsilon go to 0, so this is uh, much, much smaller than h epsilon p. Or in other words, the separation between sheets are much larger comparing to the scale epsilon. So for that, you should renormalize by h epsilon p. So which means that if you consider um, h epsilon p, uh, sorry. So we consider h epsilon x divided by h epsilon p by the same trick over there. Okay, so if you divide the whole equation by that number, so this term converted to zero. So you didn't see this p this term. This is still small o term. This is small o term. So eventually, what you get is it converts to uh, something you can do removal singularity. So which should be strictly positive because it's positive over a point such that l sigma infinity phi uh, is identical equal to v zero. Yeah, yeah. So the first case is when, when the separation between sheets are much larger than the scale epsilon. So then to, t to take the renormalization, you divide it by the height function by the height over point p. So if you divide it over the whole equation, so this is still a small o term, and this is epsilon divided by h epsilon p. So that you convert it to zero. So this inhomogeneous term is also a small o term. So when you take limits, this term disappears, this term disappears. So you cook up a Jacobi field. So that's easier when your separation is larger. So the, the most harder case is, is when two, two pieces somehow almost touch each other. So the separation is relatively small comparing to the scale epsilon. So, so the second case is uh, when this is comparable. So uh, some times epsilon. OK, so the natural thing to do is to take normalization over epsilon, because if you take normalization over s epsilon p, this term will blow up. You, you, you cannot get anything. So for this case, so the, the renormalization we do is take derivative over epsilon. So again, it converts to something which is now negative. So you may get something, you may get a function which can take zeros, because if you have two pieces touched together with each other, uh, one value can be 0. OK, so, uh, so, so this, is, this is still a smooth function over sigma. So let's see what happens to the limit. So if I divide it by epsilon, so this is still a small o term that will disappear. Divide by epsilon, so this is 1. So you do have an inhomogeneous term. And in the limit, this goes to 0, this goes to 0. So the limit is twice h restricted to sigma infinity. So such that the equation satisfied is L sigma infinity phi equals 2 times h restricted to sigma infinity. Is that OK? So, if, so, so the key idea is if you, if you make this to be 1, this gives you a non-trivial inhomogeneous term. So a priori, I think, uh, this seems to be solvable, but the observation is that you can pick up h so that this is not solvable. So, so the key lemma. OK, so my assumption is in the regular dimensions for bumpy metric for fixed number k. So there exists a function. 
uh, in the space I found with Jonathan such that uh, so any solution of the equation star uh, change, changes time. Well, by construction, so this guy is now negative, so you, you deduce a contradiction. So the proof is actually simple. So before I sketch the proof, let me just draw a picture to illustrate the idea. So, uh, so suppose you have a sequence of surfaces prescribing mean curvature surfaces. Let's forget whether prescribing or not. So suppose you have a sequence of hypersurfaces that converge to the limit so that the difference of the infinitesimal distance satisfies this equation. So what you do is you produce a, a what you do is you produce a surface so that has mean characters near more or less h or epsilon h. So, so in order to to find something bad, you would, you can imagine that the perturbation if the perturbation looks like that, if this is my perturbed surface, then you can get a contradiction for the second case. In other words, suppose for, suppose my perturbation status, suppose my perturbation looks like that. So this is my top sheet, sigma epsilon 2. So then what, what you would see for, um, for the bottom sheet, the bottom sheet should be a mirror. The bottom sheet should look like that. So this would be the bottom sheet. Okay. So they cannot be close enough to each other. Otherwise, they have to intersect somewhere, which is not allowed. So that means that if I, if I find the red perturbation so that it bump up and below, bump up and down, so the second case cannot happen. You can only go to this case, which means that the two sheets are pretty far away from each other. And then you get, you get a Jacobi field contradiction to the uh, bumpiness assumption. So, so that would be a, a motivating idea after I found the proof. So I realized this should be, this should be the, the idea how you found that. This can be true for any sigma, right? Any no, no, no. So this is this. I, I say that the k lama is under assumptions, so regular dimension, bumpy metric, and right. for fixed k. So because you know that, maybe I erase. Because we know that. It doesn't. I mean. So this satisfies the area upper bound. Satisfies the Morse index upper bound. Not not for all sigma infinity. You cannot do that for all sigma infinity. You, you can do this for special sigma infinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can do that simultaneously for all things in that class. So you know they're fine domain. Yeah, 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 I do. Let me just quickly finish the, the k lemma. So again, if I, I recall, so the set, this is a set of smooth minimal surfaces. I should give you a sub index k. So I say that this is the, the, the set of smooth closed embedded minimal hypersurfaces satisfying upper bound of area and upper bound of Morse index. So for, for generic metric, we know that this is the, this is finite number when g is, uh, is bumpy. So without uh, loss of generality, we can simply assume that you have only three component, three connect component. So if you draw the picture, so you have sigma 1, so sigma 2, and sigma 3. So if I want to find the, the, uh, the bump function, as I said, for each of them, I can, I can fix a point which is not in the intersecting site and, and localize a small neighborhood. So I find the function looks like that. I call it f1. So similarly, you can do f2. You can do f3. So you can make sure that the support of them are totally disjoint. Okay? And then you evaluate fi, you get something, you call it hi. Okay? And again, hi are supported over these small sites. So then you get, for, for this case, you get three compact supported function supported over sigma 1, 2, 3. And then you can extend it a little bit to make sure that you get a global function. Because I, Johnson and I proved that this set is open and dense, you can pick up a H that as close to the extension of all three of them. And then you pick up a H that is close to them when restricted to sigmas in any smooth norm or CK alpha norm. 
for that, for that choice of age, you know that s s by bumping this assumption, this L sigma infinity is all invertible. That means that if I choose age to uh, approximate the three functions, the pre-images should be very close to the three functions, either one of them. Then it has to change sign, contradicting the uh, phi non-negative assumption. And if you forgot this uh, arguments, and go back, that's the picture you see. So you find a perturbation so that uh, it goes up and down, sigma infinity. Then if you have two pieces with different orientations, they can't be close, too close to each other. If they can't be too close to each other, then you produce a non-trivial Jacobi field. So, so that's the geometry. OK, I think I can maybe stop here. <laughs>